but I'm going to be talking about why QE was necessary uh, in late 2008 and early 2009. Um, and this is, of course, related to the question of the causes of the Great Recession. Um, I'm going to just give you the guts of the argument now um, and state it in a fairly strong form. Uh, the cause of the Great Recession was a crash in the rate of growth of the quantity of money uh, in the leading Western economies, uh, meaning um, in this context, <coughs> United States, the Eurozone, and the UK. Uh, in this respect, it was the same as the Great Depression in the early 1930s. <coughs> uh, Japan is a kind of outlier because they had very weak money growth for a long time. Um, and the main cause, um, of the crash in money growth um, was a change in regulation in Oct from really October 2008, uh, with in particular demands for more capital to be held by banks relative to their assets, uh, which then led to banks, instead of being keen to expand their risk assets, as they had been for decades up to 2007, wanting to shrink their risk assets, in fact being obliged to shrink their risk assets, <coughs> As assets go down, that reduces um, deposits, deposits are most of money, uh, and that was then the cause of the dramatic change in the rate of growth of the quantity of money. And therefore, this change in bank regulation in really from October 2008 was a viciously deflationary policy um, at completely the wrong time. And um, the, it, it was so deflationary, it had to be offset in short order by a collapse in interest rates to virtually zero and QE, the creation of money by the state to offset the uh, effect, effects of that change in regulation uh, on the uh, back lending to the private sector. That, that's the heart of the argument. Now, um, I don't think that the case for um, deliberate money creation by the state in late 2008, early 2009 was actually anything particularly intellectually interesting, demanding, new, or whatever, uh, and was implicit in standard monetary theory at the time and had been for many years, many decades. The problem was indeed economics, uh, and the subject of economics, and in particular the neglect of um, monetary economics, uh, quantum theory of money, if you wish, of monetarism, but uh, you know, I don't particularly want to overplay that. And <coughs> the purpose of this institute I've set up is really to deal with that neglect and to say that we must return to these very simple and basic ideas. In my regard, them as simple and basic, even if they're complicated in detail. Now, um, the, I hope this, this my press is correct, please. Yeah. This is, I'm a bit, I like Spencer. This is a bit cruel, mm -hmm. but this is true. What Spencer said in um, March 2010, a year after the implementation of QE, was that the academic literature about it was in its infancy. Okay. And in the current issue of the Journal of, of Economic Literature, Mr. Chapu, who's Vice President of the St. Louis Fed, which used to be regarded as the <coughs> champion of um, quantity theory and so on, uh, and he says the theory behind QE is not well developed. Uh, and he goes on, referring to Bernanke, it sounds like called segmented markets theory. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, and then we have um, Belenke himself. This was one of his last press conferences. And he said QE works in practice. He's been going for a few years, but it doesn't work in theory to a lot of amusement around the world and in some universities. Now, look, the purpose of quantitative easing was to increase the quantity of money. Um, and um, the 
Uh, now that, that in itself is a controversial statement, but I'm going to say that because that's actually the way it was viewed in the UK uh, and um, by Mervyn King in the interview he gave when it was being done, if you gave the BBC. And also, may I just say, in some of the research work produced by the bank subsequently, some of which has been written uh, by, by Ryan and Thomas and others, and Brad and this here today. So that's how it was viewed in the UK. And, you know, I'm sorry, the basic theory here, it's, it's in hundreds of textbooks. And, you know, I'm just going to race through these, but, I mean, all of you here should have, uh, been, you know, got, gone through this kind of stuff. You know, there is a, a demand to help real money balances. You know, it's in the ISLM model, it's in lots of other models too. It depends on uh, real, real money, on real output, opportunity cost holding money, other variables. You multiply both sides by the price double. Um, and, um, you, you know, there is then an implied um, level of um, want to try and get at what the <coughs> demand to hold money must in equilibrium be equal to the supply of money created by the banking system. That's in general theory. End of chapter seven. Therefore, um, equilibrium nominal national income uh, depends on only two things, uh, the properties of a money demand function and a money demand function, and the actual quantity of money created by the banking system. Now this is just, that, that, that's it, that's just in hundreds and hundreds of textbooks. It's not new, it's been very well developed, there's nothing strange about it. And can I just say that that's it. It's end of story. You just need to know two things, the quantity of money, the property of money demand function, and you know what normal national income is. Okay. Now, look, I know that then there's a lot more to say. But can I also insist that um, there's lots of confusions about all this. And what we've had in discussions of QE um, is references to all sorts of things that in my view are not central, in some cases not germane at all, to this subject. Um, there's a talk about the aim of QE being to reduce credit spreads. This is Alan Blinder in the United States says that kind of thing. We get also talk about being relevant to credit conditions or something. Um, it's important to... None of these things, you simply need to know two things to understand economic and national income which is a money demand function and a quantity of money, and that's that. The theory goes back a long way and is really concerned with two questions in particular. One is, um, what are the effects of a change in a quantity of money? Very simple question. Uh, probably the you know, the classic statement is Patinkin, money, interest, and prices, 1956, such conditions. But that question has been around, again, for a very long time. <coughs> what Quantilian did was to increase the quantity of money. This question is directly relevant to it, okay? It's a very old question. Um, the other question is, what are the effects, slightly different question, of a change in the rate of growth of the quantity <coughs> of money that has also been around some time, and I would regard Friedman's 1963 uh, tentative sketch in an article he did with um, Anna Schwartz, it's really the best statement about, about that, but again, these things have been about a very long time, and the notion that, um, you know, there's something, this stuff has been around for centuries. Um, <coughs> the first sort of real material discussion of money and uh, spending was, was actually in the Spanish Salamanca school in the 16th century Chamber now Frenchman, etc., etc., going through to all these people in the 20th century. <coughs> There's nothing new about this subject. You know, the notion that somehow something weird happened in late 2008, early 2009 is fantastic. And I'm sorry, I said as much. It was quite fantastic. So, what then is the central message? of this very large body of theory. It's enormous literature. Well, what all of these people, um, and they really are, they all have the same basic message. And again, I know there's all sorts of caveats and different 
spring holes and, and they're different. Just, you know, I don't know all the problems about that, okay, fair enough. But they basically all agree that if the money the market function is given and the argument in that function, the opportunity cost of holding money, the payments technology and so on, if they're fairly constant, then changes in the quantity of money are associated with, they haven't used cause there, but changes in the quantity of money are associated with equiproportional changes in the quantity of, in the level of, of, of equilibrium national income. And if output's given, there's an equiproportional change in the price level. Uh, so, um, simple as that. Um, Germans done this in a rather obvious way in Weimar in 1923. We limited, I think, in the 1970s, we have forgotten it. Anyway, um, nowadays the dominant form of money, this is perhaps more, more controversial, the dominant form of money, um, <coughs> bank deposits, which then implies, very simply, that this. Okay? Um, an X percent rise or fall in the level of bank deposits is associated with an X percent rise or fall in the level of national income output expenditure. This is an extremely strong statement. And I know there's all sorts of caveats and ifs and buts and all sorts of difficulties. Let's get the core proposition straight before we start making all the, all the little qualifications. Um, Sorry, the evidence is overwhelming. You know, you, you put, you know, that, that David Hendry at Nuffield, my old college, squabbling with multiple about thesis. <coughs> you put a thesis on this, this and it's 30. So the, the theory is basically correct. Okay. Yeah, and then in the short run, it's all rather medium term and long run, but, but, but in, the, in, in the short run, what we see is, and this is a bit more complicated and much more sort of um, difficult, if you like. There's a large um, rise or fall in the rate of grain change with the real quantity of the bank deposits associated with strength and weakness asset prices, when I spent most of my career advising clients about in the city, and also uh, acceleration, deceleration, rate of change for your final demand. So, and we do see these things in the real world. And what's keeping money and national income together is what are called real balance effects. And it's, it's got various names, there's hot potato stories, PQU effects, big cell process, and so on. But, but, but I won't go into all that now. Basically, this stuff is not very difficult and it's not very controversial. And what it means is that policymakers should make sure that, that there is some stability in the rate of growth of the quantity of money. Um, over over time. And can I say they have to do this? They have to do this even if there is no specific, precise target for the rate of growth of, of the quantity of money. If they don't do this, they'll get to economic instability. Um, and obviously one of the key messages of Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's uh, the United States uh, in 1963 was that the Great Depression in America wasn't caused by weaknesses of capitalism, was caused by a dramatic fall in the rate of change in the uh, quantity of money. Roughly in the 1920s, money had been growing. Bank deposits, about 5% a year, and then from 1929 to 33, they fell by about 1% a month, about 10% a year, and that caused this dominant factor in the severity of, of, the, of the Great Depression. Never to happen again, must it? This is the, the chart. What I've done is to analyze rates of growth of bank deposits, essentially, the quantity of money over six month periods for the USA, the Eurozone, and the UK. Uh, there's a lot of nitty gritty detail here that we can discuss. Um, I've taken, as far as the USA is concerned, I haven't used official Fed figures. I would <coughs> prepare M3 figures again, but this is actually what happened. So <coughs> you can see, I mean, obvious, yeah? Is it any surprise, given this, that there were some problems coming up 
in late 2008, early 2009. Okay, and that is the why was this uh, happening? The growth of bank deposits of money depends essentially on the growth of banks' assets, um, and that depends. I'm going to ignore all of the external complications and this. I'm going to ignore the moment the question of banks' capital. The growth of bank assets depends on the increase in claims on the private sector, essentially mostly bank lending, or claims on the state. In the 1940s, of course, um, the big increase in bank assets uh, was in government securities and other kinds of claims on governments because of the Second World War and in 1950 and even in the mid-1960s, a great majority of British banks' assets were claimed on the government. In the um, 60 years to 2008, roughly from 1948, 47, 48, when the growth of the stock of bank lending in the private sector was faster than the rate of growth of bank balance sheets as a whole and of the quantity of money, um, as this dominance of claims on the government gave way to a dominance of claims on the private sector. So that in 2006, uh, UK banks, their assets were only about, I think, less than 1% of that, on some measures, actually negative, um, only 1% of claims on UK government, having been in sort of 1945, more like 80% claimed on the British government. So the banks had massively increased their claims, risk claims on private sector. And uh, what happened uh, in um, 2007, 2008, 2009 was this process went into reverse. Notice the scales here, these again the same UK, United States, Eurozone. 15% um, growth rates in the stock of bank credit the private sector in these years, 10-15%, okay, going to minus numbers here. So the force driving the growth of bank balance sheets and broad money in the uh, um, dominant force in the 60 years up to 2008 went into reverse. If there had been nothing done, this was going to cause, notice the scale as I said, this is going to cause bank deposits to start falling by half to 1% a month, as in the US Great Depression, we were therefore heading for another Great Depression. That's why QB was needed, all right? To offset, and also the stash of interest rates are off. I've got to move quickly because I'm taking up. Yeah, you take another five minutes. All right, well, anyway. This is the United States. These numbers are not available from the Fed. They're available from the IMF. The, the Fed doesn't produce these figures. It tells you something, doesn't it? I mean, you can get some insight into them from Fed data, but this actual, you know, the IMF framework methodology isn't really used in the Fed. They don't look at the credit counterparts to borrow money in the Fed. Um, in the five years to, keep the, uh, to, to, to the third quarter, 2008, <laughs> significant. Um, the US banks' claims on the private sector rose by four and a half trillion dollars. Claims on the US government fell, not just by a little bit. Following five years, 700 million, from four and a half to 700. That, by the way, includes Fed's own mortgage backed securities, etc. etc. So the commercial banks negative. This is claimed on the government, essentially actually claims it's, it's, it's the bank's cash reserves. Okay. That actually is less than about half that previous rate, half rate of growth. Then money growth did continue. At the time. So the question then is, you know, why? What's, what caused this change in the rate of growth of lending to the private sector? Now, I've got, to, you know, I've got to move very quickly. There are two changes in the banking environment in this period, two key changes. 
The first one was the freeze of the interbank market in August 2007. There's an awful lot to say about how the growth of the interbank market in the, really the last 30 years, about 60 years, maintained the growth of the bank lending to the private sector. But then the other one was the change in bank regulation from October 2008, and indeed demands in some places for actual deleveraging of banks. I'll talk a little bit about Lima later on. <coughs> Which of these two was the dominant force in the contraction of bank lending? <laughs> because obviously, if it's this one, the bankers are to blame. Right. I'm going to, again, I'm stereotyping, I'm sort of, I'm being very quick, and I know it's much more complicated, but I'm trying to get over the key points. This is the, the banks for their own folly, right? This, I'm sorry, this is caused by regulatory officialdom, right? Now, let me just get clear that I, I accept that there were some problems from 2007, <laughs> and then you did speak some things sort of that. I don't think it's anything worse than the LTCM crisis, the Russian crisis, mm -hmm. all that work has, there was nothing in my view that, that justified what then happened. And now I'm going to show you that, in fact, the big change in lending the private sector occurred after October 2008. You can see this in the US numbers, this again is taken actually from the IMF, but it's actually, I'm sure I get it from Fed data too, but this is the jump. This is, is late 2008 after October 2008. This is equity risk assets on, on, in IMF data, bank sector. And then um, it's really, these, these are new, this is the new, new bit of my presentation today, if you like, I haven't presented these figures before. These show you using IMF data, and there's a lot of problems with IMF data, but the rates of change of credit to private sector in these different periods. So the, um, that was in the run-up two years before the um, closure of the interbank market 2007. Very high rates of growth. I mean, Australia 20.4, UK, Eurozone. I mean, this, um, anyway, this then is the period after um, August 2007. They're still pretty high, aren't they? Yeah. And then this is the two years from Q3 2008, and they're dramatically different. And then this is five years from uh, 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 Q3 2008, October 2008, still carrying on for years and years after October 2008. The change wasn't really in August 2007, and maybe it was perfectly manageable what was going on then, <clears throat> the change was actually the tightening of bank regulation. That's what caused this precipitous collapse in the rate of growth of quantity money in very severe form, then had to be offset by, by QE. There are some problems, uh, let me just, again, this, this is, just brings this out. This changes um, into back comparing the interbank market of the previous two years. So there is a deceleration in the growth of credit. Okay. Not out of line with previous cycles. This is really where it changed. Okay. Um, in the UK, by the way, this, this, these numbers appear to be a bit off because actually the rate of growth of credit practice increased in this group. We know it didn't. And that actually is the effect of these intermediate official financial corporations. I mean, right, and I can get into all this later. In fact, when you use the bank's own data, you see this pattern, but we can talk about that um, detail in a sense. Um, this is the change, that bar, between August 2007 and October 2008. This is the change afterwards, where I've actually used, uh, for the UK, uh, Bank of England data. It's obvious the big change was from, uh, up, was from Q3 2008, not before. Okay, um, I'm going to, I've taken up a lot of time. Um, can I move through very quickly? Um, you know, this is, this is my central point. Now, can I just, you know, just finish by saying that um, the, 
My interpretation, <clears throat> therefore, of this whole episode is that it's just like the Great Depression in the sense that Friedman and Schwartz criticized the Fed uh, in, 19, in the 1960s, in the, in the, in the, in the 1963 book on it. It's just the same. This was a completely avoidable crisis that the run up to uh, the Lehman uh, uh, um, Brothers affair was, there were some problems. But nobody in the middle of 2008, none of the big forecasters expected what was about to happen. It was a crisis that was so ineptly handled that what should have been a perfectly manageable slowdown became a major catastrophe. I forget the exact phrase that uh, Friedman and Schwartz use, but I just use exactly the same phrase if, if I could remember, remember it properly. And can I just, before I finish, and I know this is going to crop up in conversation afterwards, um, I just want to say a little bit, if I've got it here, I think I've got it here somewhere. The notion that the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy could have caused a catastrophe of this, uh, this, this scale is absolute bunk. <coughs> The Lehman Brothers was one medium-sized institution. Um, Lehman International didn't lose any money, by the way. It paid off creditors in full. The loss in the states was essentially, essentially became a, a bank involved in real estate speculation, went bust. Lost about $150 billion. This is a flea bite relative to US GDP, tiny relative to world GDP. How on earth can this affect Australia and Sweden, for heaven's sake? Over you know, a period of five years afterwards. Nonsense. The, 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 the dominant causes of that contraction in, in the rate of growth of bank claims on the private sector was the change in regulation, and the reason for that was a blunder by official government. Thank you very much. <laughs>